please stand by. We're about to begin. Good day and welcome to the Alston and Bird weekly webinar series, Making the Most of Tax Reform. Today's session is Prospect of Technical Corrections in the New Congress. Today's webinar is being recorded. At this time, I'd like to turn the webinar over to Mr. Scott Hardy. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I um, hope you all had a, a nice holiday weekend. My name is Scott Hardy, and I'm a partner in the Federal and International Tax Group with Alston and Bird. And this morning, I'm joined by former Congressman Earl Pomeroy and Carolyn Smith from our D.C. office, and Jack Cummings is joining us again from our Raleigh office. Um, last week, Jack started us out uh, with our series discussing uh, Section 163J and the new limitation on interest deductions. And <clears throat> just if, you're, if you missed that and are interested in receiving those materials, the slides as well as the audio uh, are posted on our website. So you can uh, lo locate those on our website or you can just email us and we can make sure that you get those. Um, this week we're going to be looking at the prospect for a technical corrections bill in the new Congress. And then uh, next week, just looking ahead, we'll be talking about the new Qualified Business Interest Deduction or Income Deduction under 199 Cap A, and then following that, we'll be looking at the BEAT. Um, after today's call, you should receive an email, so if you are interested in signing up for other webinars and haven't, then you'll be able to do that. There'll be a link in that email, and you can register for other uh, webinars if you like. So just a reminder, our goal uh, in our webinar series is really to provide a general overview of the topics uh, that we're discussing and spot issues uh, that may be of interest to uh, clients. And we might not address a specific issue that, that you're looking into or that you're interested, interested in. So if you want to ask a question, please do so. We welcome questions. And you can submit those at any time during the call um, on um, your web browser there. <clears throat> and we may not be able to answer the question, um, but if we don't during the call, we will definitely get back to you on your question. And also, if you do type in a question, uh, please know that um, other participants on the call are not able to see those questions. Only we can see those questions. So we're going to do our best to stay within our 30-minute window today. Um, but there's a chance we might go over. We'll try to limit that. Uh, this morning, just given the nature of this topic, we've decided to um, have our discussion uh, in a format that's more of a conversation and, and not have slides. So uh, we really don't have slides to share today, so we're just going to have a, a talk. Um, and given our limited time, let's go ahead and get started. So I just want to introduce our um, uh, panelists, um, Earl Pomeroy. We're grateful to have Earl join us as a former congressman. He served for 18 years as a member of Congress and on the House Ways and Means Committee uh, for 10 years. And now he works with clients on a variety of policy issues before legislative and executive branches of government. Um, Carolyn served with the Congressional Joint Committee on Taxation for 20 years, where she was the Associate Deputy Chief of Staff and counseled members uh, of the House Ways and Means and Senate Finance Committees. And uh, Earl and Carolyn work closely together on policy-related matters. Uh, Jack joined us last week, and he's a counsel in our uh, Raleigh office and D.C. office as well, and served as associate chief counsel at the IRS. So let's get started. Um, from the beginning, when the TCJA was passed in December of 2017, there was a lot of discussion about the technical corrections bill. And so I think just before we begin, it would be helpful to have a common understanding of what exactly is meant by technical corrections. So um, I'm just going to ask maybe, Carolyn, you can just briefly explain what a technical corrections bill is. Uh, thanks, Scott. Um, actually, um, as you mentioned, I worked in the Joint Committee on Taxation for 20 years, and um, uh, in that capacity, worked on a lot of technical corrections uh, packages. Uh, the first being uh, technical corrections to the Tax Reform Act of 1986. I started on the staff three days before the conference on that, on that, and um, that was my first and many followed technical corrections. Um, packages. Um, it is just to start out by saying it is not unusual for a bill of this magnitude to um, produce um, many, many uh, technical corrections. Um, any piece of large, large pieces of legislation often do um, for a variety of things. Uh, 
people are human and make mistakes. And also, um, inevitably, um, there's always um, whether the process, as with Tax Cut and Jobs Act, was pretty quick uh, all the way. There's always a very quick process towards the end, um, which makes the likelihood of errors increase. So, what do we mean by technical corrections? Well, in general terms, what the um, there is. Typically, for a what people sometimes now refer to as a true technical correction, a very narrow definition, um, and you know, typos and things and commas, you know, surely clearly technical. But beyond that, it's really things that uh, errors in drafting that are identified, which do not properly reflect congressional intent at the time. And the process of determining what technical corrections, what Congress meant at the time when it was drafting, is typically gone through, first of all, um, through an extensive staff review, and it's a sixth staff review traditionally that has included both the minority and majority in the Ways and Means and Finance Committees, regardless of who was in the majority or at, at the time a bill was passed. It also includes the uh, Treasury IRS staff, as well as the staff of the Joint Committee on Taxation. And typically the Joint Tax Committee, uh, the staff where I worked, works as kind of the repository and pro pro uh, provides and collects lists and lists of possible technical corrections, which are drawn from a variety of sources, including the staff that I just mentioned. Um, often they come through Treasury and IRS as they work through the regulatory process, and we have seen that happen here in many cases. Um, as well as um, people coming in, outsiders, taxpayers coming in as they begin to implement the act and say, hey, we want to get this change. We think it's a technical correction. And so uh, they collect lists and then typically they will have meetings again with all of these six staffs to work through and develop a consensus as to what is considered uh, to be a technical correction. Um, in terms of um, scoring, um, by definition, um, the Joint Committee on Taxation, which does the um, revenue estimating scorekeeping uh, for Congress for tax bills. Um, by definition, under their processes, a technical correction has no revenue impact, um, and therefore it has zero revenue. The rationale behind this is that, well, if it is a technical correction, just conforming the statute to what Congress intended, um, then in theory, it would have been taken into account in the revenue impact of the prior bill, and so they just don't they just don't count it. Um, so a lot of weight. Um, is placed on calling something a technical correction versus some other change um, that in retrospect maybe people people want to make. Um, and so the process um, in this case, um, I think has gone through a little bit different in talking to various folks on the Hill. Um, and in part, I think that reflects the way the Tax Cut and Jobs Act itself uh, went through. Um, and I think, again, when we say technicals, that tech def generally has a very narrow meaning, but ultimately um, things technicals and other fixes, if I, if you could see me, I have my air quotes. People um, just in, uh, often uh, use a wider um, definition of technical to mean things that they would like to have done, even though they might not fit this, this very, uh, this very uh, narrow definition. Typically, what you have seen in the past in terms of a technical corrections bill, um, uh, particularly if there are big changes that need to be made, that you will see the four um, members, the chair and ranking member of Ways and Means and Finance Committee, introducing a technical corrections bill all at one time to reflect the fact that this is a joint product. Um, and I've seen that many times, particularly so if there's an effective date issue or something else, they want it to be out there in public to let taxpayers and the IRS know, hey, this is really um, what we intended it to be. Um, in this case, obviously, we haven't seen that yet, although um, uh, former Chairman Brady um, has introduced, introduced a bill. Um, and so that's kind of uh, typically what happens. Again, this process this time is a little bit different, um, but that's the traditionally in all the 20 years I was there and since then that has gone on in terms of the technical corrections process. Um, <clears throat> so this, this kind of uh, relates back, I guess, to the way the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was passed. It was um, passed through the reconciliation process, <clears throat> which um, may or may not have been controversial, but uh, it required a lower threshold uh, to make it through the Senate. Um, and maybe begs the question as to why, you know, prior to the recent change in Congress, there was not a technical corrections bill in 2018 when the Republicans controlled both houses. Can you kind of speak to that process as to getting um, the sure. bill through Congress? 
Um, sure. I will say, yeah, the, the difference in process in terms of reconciliation between sort of regular order um, or uh, where we are now outside of reconciliation is that in the Senate, as you mentioned, it requires only a simple majority, 51 votes. Um, and so um, it's easier to get through and can be done on a partisan basis. Outside the reconciliation process, um, uh, generally Senate rules would require 60 votes, and so um, it would require um, even uh, more, uh, will require Democratic support uh, to get to that level in the Senate, apart from, of course, the switch uh, in control in the House. Um, the other thing I might want to notice is even if we were in a reconciliation, uh, reconciliation provisions have to have some revenue impact under the budget rules, and so true technical corrections that have a zero score won't pass muster. So they would have to have some other tweak or something to make it have at least some sort of negligible revenue impact. Otherwise, it could not be included in a budget reconciliation bill. Um, and, it's, and in terms of your comment, well, why didn't we have technical corrections in 2018? Um, in terms of uh, there actually was one one fix, which or, or we may get to um, a little bit later, but that it generally takes time for all of these things, technicals, to, to work their way out. The um, 1986 Tax Act, it was two years before technical corrections were passed, and so it's not unusual for it to sort of take some time uh, for the process to work its way through. Yeah, that's, that's helpful, uh, you know, at least to help explain why there hasn't been technical corrections yet, and maybe that leads into kind of the environment that we're in where a new Congress has been sworn in. And maybe it's helpful, uh, Earl, if you could kind of just give us just a sense of the environment up on the Hill in which um, a discussion of technical corrections would even be considered at this point. Sure, Scott. Uh, you know, we're talking to you from Carolyn's office where on the wall she has a picture of the signing of the uh, 86 Act. Uh, you have Ronald Reagan proudly stroking the pen and beaming uh, over his shoulder, uh, not just uh, at that time, the Finance Committee Chairman, Robert Dole, who we're very proud to consider a colleague here at Alston Bird, but Dan Rostenkowski, the Democratic Chair of the Ways and Means Committee, who was also an essential part of the passage of that bill. Uh, this picture speaks to the bipartisan sense of achievement that the institution of Congress had as they passed that major tax reform bill. This bill is completely different in the uh, setup uh, it, is a, it was passed on a, an entirely partisan basis, uh, and not accidentally so. Uh, it, it, the the uh, setup was very much wanted a situation where the Republicans all voted for and the Democrats all voted against. Uh, take that to the midterms, and you've got one party clearly showing they're for tax reform and the other clearly showing they're not. Additionally, you have... Uh, you have the stimulative effect of the tax cuts juicing the economy, so you have passed this substantial tax bill go with a roaring economy into the midterms, uh, and, and that was, frankly, the political play called by the majority. You know, <laughs> elections have consequences. They had the votes. They could do it that way. Uh, to everyone's surprise, uh, it, 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 there was not a popular response to the bill. Uh, you speculate on reasons for that, uh, uh, and then, I, you know, it, if I were to propound uh, reasons, it would, it would be just that, speculation. But in any event, uh, the election is held, and one thing is quite clear, there was hardly a popular response on the tax bill, notwithstanding the fact that the bill, although it was originally going to be revenue neutral, backed away from that promise, the bill focused on corporate tax reform, a very meaningful character that, that did have some bipartisan appeal. By the time they got the individual tax cuts and, for that matter, limitations, in, for example, relative to limiting the salt deduction, by the time you've got all that baked in, you have a highly controversial package that cleaves pretty cleanly along partisan lines. Well, you saw in the course of the year, uh, as as the bill didn't work, other proposals being announced. Chairman Brady in the fall of the election saying, well, we've got tax cuts 2.0, and he rolled out another bill. You had uh, President Trump it, late in October saying, and by the way, we're going to do another 10 percent individual cut. I think these are just – they weren't serious tax proposals. They were trying to 
capture the tax dynamic that just wasn't working for them heading into the midterms. Curiously, I, I do not understand the kind of effort that Chairman Brady put into the technical corrections slash extenders bill after the election. I like Kevin Brady, who served with him. I was on the other side of the aisle. Uh, he is a very agreeable by nature, but he certainly did not make outreach relative to try to get bipartisan buy-in uh, before the election. I think that was on a political call, but after the election either. So he had quite a bit of staff time invested in a te technical corrections bill that had no bipartisan buy-in whatsoever and couldn't pass with the Democrats not wanting anything to pass until they take the gavel for the, for the, uh, uh, the committee. Uh, what we're now hearing from uh, Richie Neal, Richie Neal is the incoming chair of the Ways and Means Committee. This is an important development. Uh, he's been on the committee for 26 years. He served four years with Dan Roskinkowski, who was, you know, may have uh, somewhat of a mixed reputation out there, but by my view, was the last Democratic leader of the committee that knew what he was doing in a, in a very, uh, uh, you know, kind of a significant and effective way to move legislation. So he comes in with this pragmatic, more or less pro-business orientation. New members have now been appointed to the committee, about 10 new Democrats. Uh, at least five of them are formally affiliated with the Blue Dogs of New Democrats, meaning they are kind of from the centrist side of the caucus. Uh, certainly all aspects of the caucus represented in the new members, but uh, Richie Neal was very aggressive in making sure that he had people he could work with. Uh, so that's the setup uh, as we come into uh, the, the new Congress. Now, what's, what does the starting bell look like? It looks like hearings. Uh, that's based on both the formal comments of the chairman as well as what their staff are telling Carolyn and me as we have met with them. There's a lot to chew on here with this new tax bill. And while undeniably both sides would agree there's a no small number of hiccups in there that need technical corrections and in a bipartisan sense you'd have these things moving forward pretty expeditiously when you have the new majority out of the Ways and Means Committee with no buy-in and no uh, uh, familiarity really with a lot of these provisions uh, they're going to be spending some time in hearing status before anything moves. You mentioned deal making Scott there is the tax extenders a lot of tax provisions, Democrats like expire at the end of the year, they were not extended. I think some of these uh, provisions, technical corrections provisions, could be part of an extender's deal, but it won't happen soon. There's gonna be some study on this before anything happens, I think. Uh, what, what do I mean by that? I mean I mean months, you know, but, but a good chunk of this first year uh, trying to assess what, what's, what has happened with this bill and, and where the new majority will take it. Uh, yeah, if I can just add um, to that in terms of, of course, one of the things that kind of uh, messes up um, any sort of tax legislative schedule, in fact, the legislative schedule in general, is that we still have an ongoing government shutdown. And so the first priority for the Congress is working with the administration to get that resolved. And um, the longer that that goes on, the longer it makes some of these, makes it more, you know, the committees will not sort of hold off on their normal agendas forever, but it makes it hard to address anything else. And so, for example, um, the tax extenders that, that Earl mentioned, you know, there had been some hope. Um, really, I mean, there's a lot of interest, um, uh, certainly in the House Democrats, but bipartisan interest in the Senate in trying to get extenders done, and the new incoming uh, Republican Chairman Grassley has also expressed interest. Um, uh, and these would be extenders um, that would, for provisions that had expired, and so to extend them retroactively for 2018. So they need to get done fairly quickly um, because we're already about to begin the filing process. And so the more the shutdown gets delayed, the more an extender's discussion can get delayed, and that will impact um, um, other uh, other issues as well, like technical. That's helpful. So just to um, to go back real quickly to something I think you said, Earl, um, exiting Chairman Brady introduced uh, his technical corrections bill, and in terms of Chairman Neal moving forward with hearings, is is the Brady bill essentially just an unhelpful document and, and we're just kind of starting from scratch or is there are there components of it that might be useful to Chairman Neal's efforts or what do you, what do you think about how, kind of how Chairman Brady left? Well, I don't think that uh, the new chairman will view it, you know, like 
well, whatever Brady did, we're going to do the opposite, and it's got no consequence. I, that's just not the way Richie Neal approaches things. On the other mm-hmm. hand, again, there's they're, they're zero buy, and I, I think that if you look on a, uh, on a positive side, maybe you could take a look at uh, Brady's technical corrections bill and say, well, here's where the outgoing majority say uh, there's some problems with the, with the text of what we passed, and we need to fix it. And and so you know those those a lot of these problems are just tax practitioner matters, and they're not uh, our tax policy matters. They're not necessarily grist for the political debate. You know, they, there's a lot of things in there people could probably agree on. Uh, but it, one thing's for sure: it's not going to be well. This is the this new Congress is just going to roll forward with that technical corrections bill that was built in December. It will be built from scratch. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, mm-hmm. and I, so I, I think that uh, the, the former chairman's work in maybe identifying some things that need attention is helpful. On the other hand, the former chairman did not uh, invite the new majority to participate last year, and so they're not going to they're not going to be giving it particular credit on a political basis. Now, some of its technical strength may uh, may make the, the document still meaningful. Mm-hmm. And I think that there there are a few sort of high level issues that folks have acknowledged on both sides of, of the aisle that sort of need to be addressed. Um, and I do think that at some point there will be a technical corrections bill. Whether there are you know certain um, things that are viewed more time sensitive get pulled into this piece of legislation or that. Um, but but ultimately I think that there will be um, there will be something that happens that but but not soon for most things I would say. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe in terms of that process, um, you know, the blue book refers to technical corrections I think like 70 or 75 times, quite a lot, and. <laughs> You know, clients certainly know that there's a lot of issues out there that are material for certain clients. Um, as as we go through this process, kind of what what should clients be doing or or thinking about um, uh, as as Chairman Neal proceeds with with looking at technical corrections if they have issues that you know they want considered in that process. Well, well, my view, and I'm sure or we'll may have some comments too, is that is that the thing about legislation is that when you the time comes when a piece of legislation is moving along and you think, okay, it has some legs now, that's often kind of a little bit too late to start to raise an issue because it's already moved along. So companies and other other groups have already been talking to the Hill. Uh, well, first starting with Treasury and then going to Hill talking about technical corrections. So I think it's important if folks have things that they are interested in, whether it's you know noted in the blue book or not, I don't think the blue book reflects all the scope of what could be technical, to talk to members, talk to the Hill, and, uh, and let them know what the issues are so that at least that there is some uh, something that's been discussed uh, if and when uh, the opportunity arises and to get a sense of whether or not this this needs uh, to be something that needs to be addressed. Um, you know, Treasury has tried to, to look at things, um, and in fact, I think a lot of those 70 that Blue Book mentioned may very well have come from the, the regulatory process. Um, and it's also helpful to go talk to Treasury, too, since if Congress doesn't have to fix something, they just assume not. And so it's good to start there, even if even if it, if it prevents, um, uh, you know, even if you just go to the Hill and so when somebody in the Hill says, if you talk to Treasury, you can say, yeah, we hid and they didn't they didn't do it or or whatever. But I think it's still helpful to talk about and go in and meet about technical corrections. I would say that's, that's absolutely right. The Constitution uh, affords the guaranteed right to petition your government. And, and, and what this petitioning now needs to do is really get into the details of tax and business and what the problem is uh, and try and stay out of that big messy political debate, which is you know unresolved and goes on and on. Uh, we, sometime along the line, these guys have to get some business done, and and, and so setting the stage with uh, uh, educating tax staff about particular problems in the bill and how it's producing a bad effect for our economy, costing us jobs, putting these uh, issues into a, a a broader public policy context. But based on specific business circumstances, I think will be the way to, even in this terrible environment, begin to peck away. Uh, let's uh, let's uh, reference the uh, the one substantial fix that happened already, the uh, the, the highly uh, publicized grain glitch, uh, which happened last year. A a provision was added late for farm grain co-ops. Well. It, it, in actual effect, it gave the co-ops a, 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 a competing with 
businesses that are also in the grain business but not structured as co cooperatives a clear, meaningful tax advantage. It had to be fixed. It was just completely unfair. Uh, but it wasn't resolved based on the issue itself. Democrats demanded a hefty pound of flesh to fix it last year in the context of uh, uh, new support for, uh, for affordable housing uh, tax credits. And so my, the great irony is, uh, I've said, the, the, the fellow that moved the grain glitch into the bill uh, inadvertently became the great champion for affordable housing in this country because that's what ultimately was delivered as a result of getting that error fixed. I look for some of these some of these things to happen, uh, no question, as we work it through some of the problems that the bill inadvertently caused. Mm -hmm. so there may be other instances of that. <clears throat> Does, uh, maybe you touched on this a bit, Carolyn, but with the, the shutdown ongoing and extenders still there, um, will the will there be a receptive audience on the Hill to these types of issues? If you're going up to talk about arcane tax law, um, that may not be front and center in their mind because they have so many other issues. H how will that be received in this environment, do you think? Um, well, I think, as Earl said, I mean, the shutdown is a big political issue in, on everybody's mind, and there are issues surrounded that, but people are aware that there are other things going on, and I think if you wait until the shutdown's result, you know, other business is going on as well in the normal business um, uh, as, it, as it would in a, in a new Congress, and so I think I think you still need to kind of go and, and, and talk to people if you have issues, um, as, the, as Earl said, at the more mundane of technical tax issues. Um, um, but but waiting until this shutdown ends completely before getting in touch um, could could um, be not helpful to folks. Well, I would suggest uh, like trying to identify a constituent link to one of the members of the Ways and Means Committee, uh, the majority, uh, and and going in and the conversation starts something like this: We're a proud constituent. We have X number of jobs. We uh, are making this investment. We support community activities in this way and that way. Oh, by the way, we have a problem. And, and getting into the details of the tax problem, but hooking it. You know, these uh, these members of Congress, they're supposed to take care of the circumstances of their constituents. And if it's a corporate constituent with a business tax circumstance, well, they're supposed to take care of that. If, if they can be uh, persuaded uh, that there is a policy interest in addressing this, not just a business favor. Uh, you know, we, gosh, our earnings didn't come in quite like they wanted because of this deal. You know, that may or may not be persuasive, probably not so much, but put it in the context of jobs and, and the, the, the role of the, the, the constituent interest in the district, and that's how you engage people, really outside of this messy, nasty, broad uh, partisan fight. That's that's just doing particular constituent business, and I think there's, there's I think there even in this environment still an opportunity to move that kind of thing forward. That's great. Um, I, I kind of want to look at the flip side of this real quickly. Um, yeah, in some cases, taxpayers and practitioners have wanted the IRS to maybe take some action to fix some of these glitches in the law, and the IRS. Um, may not feel like it has the authority to do so, which essentially puts um, the ball back in the hands of Congress, and we're talking about technical corrections as a result. In other cases, um, the IRS may be exceeding its authority. Perhaps taxpayers or practitioners aren't very happy with the, the regulations that the IRS has put out, and so there's a sense that maybe there's some overreach there. And, and um, Jack, I was Hoping you could speak a little bit to when a taxpayer senses or practitioner senses that there has been some overreach beyond what the statute requires. How should how should clients be thinking about that? What um, opportunities or action could could they take in those instances? We think that in today's environment, um, there are many opportunities for taxpayers uh, that may not have existed 10, 15 years ago. Uh, in in disagreeing with uh, with frankly the uh, large uh, raft of uh, proposed regulations soon to be finalized under the 2017 Act. In general, the proposed regulations made quite a few taxpayer favorable calls. However, there are uh, definitely uh, uh, taxpayer unfavorable calls, and there are also other things uh, that were not dealt with in the proposed regulations. There will be many, many audit disputes 
or perspective audit disputes that uh, taxpayers are, can anticipate as they are filing their returns, and therefore taxpayers are going to have a lot of choices to make in terms of how to report, uh, frankly, mostly cross-border transactions, uh, and uh, secondly, how to deal with their financial auditors, because the financial auditors uh, tend to be very uh, strict um, on uh, uh, taking tax positions without you know, pretty tight legal opinions behind them. So we, we have already heard from uh, two or three uh, large taxpayers with this type of problem about reporting uh, transactions already under the new act, particularly under Section 965. If you, once you work through uh, taking your reporting position and, and however much, you know, backup that requires in terms of a legal opinion and you satisfy your auditors and you perhaps get into an audit or pay a tax that you don't think you should have paid and you want to have it refunded, you, you, a lot of taxpayers are going to be facing litigation under the provisions of the 2017 Act. And, and as I've indicated, it, it, today is a new day for uh, tax litigation that uh, contests uh, even uh, very well thought out positions that the Treasury has taken in a regulation. And we need only cite one case for that, Altera, which I'm sure most people on the phone have heard of as an example of how uh, it's easier than we ever thought to uh, overturn a Treasury regulation. Also, um, the uh, principle of Chevron deference to uh, at least to legislative regulations is under heavy attack, and there's a wide expectation that the Supreme Court will revisit Chevron deference in the next few months, frankly, before it goes on vacation in, in the summer and may actually uh, overturn the Chevron decision. So in, in conclusion, if, if a taxpayer faces uh, taking a, uh, a filing position uh, it's contrary to one of these many proposed regulations of the 2017 Act that it does not believe is right, taxpayer will have uh, basically two ways to go. Either the regulation is a legislative regulation uh, under some specific grant to, in effect, write the law. And if it is, then under the the Altera approach, the government's going to have to explain is going to have to have explained itself really, really well, and really cogently, and really uh, 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 correctly in its preamble. And that's why these preambles are so long. Uh, else, it it stands a good chance of uh, losing and losing Chevron deference. Con Contrarywise, if the regulation purports simply to be an interpretive regulation, not a legislative regulation, but simply Treasury's view of what the words of the statute means, those regulations have get basically no deference at all in court. And the taxpayer is pretty much free to argue to the court a different uh, interpretation of the statute, and, and the, most courts are going to feel pretty free to adopt those different interpretations. So either way you go, taxpayers uh, who disagree with these proposed and soon to be finalized regulations will have a lot of ground for litigation. And uh, as I indicated, it's a new day for that. And, and taxpayers with large dollar amounts at issue should really be thinking about those litigation and, 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 and dispute opportunities. Yeah, that's great, uh, Jack. Thank you for giving us that perspective. I, I think it's important for clients to consider both of these alternatives, whether it be a technical corrections or uh, looking at the regulations and potential challenges. Um, and, and we're going to touch on this on the series as we review the regulation packages. We'll bring to light areas where th there may have been some overreach. Um, if we don't have any questions, I think that'll draw us to a close. Sorry, we went a little bit long, but that was very helpful, everyone. Um, Thank you for joining us, everyone, and uh, we look forward to speaking uh, with you next week about uh, the business income deduction, and um, we will um, talk to you then. Thank you. This does conclude today's conference. We thank you for your participation.